Welcome to Science and Wisdom Live, where scientists and meditators meet. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this uh, second dialogue of Science and Wisdom Live. Yeah. I am Marco Kulmagi. And my name is Saida Pondelu. And together we manage um, Science and Wisdom Live, a project of Jamyang Buddhist Center, London, whose main aim is to promote the dialogue between researchers in the many fields of science and experienced meditators from different contemplative traditions. And since we really like challenges tonight, we are going to explore a very fundamental question, uh, one that scientists, mystics, and philosophers have asked time and time again throughout human history. What is the fundamental nature of reality? Is the world the way we experience it in our everyday life? Or is there a deeper level which is hidden from our habitual sensory perception? And both modern science and the ancient wisdom of contemplative traditions tell us that our idea of the world as composed of many separate entities independent from us as observers might not be a completely accurate description of reality and that there is a more fundamental level which is accessible through scientific or contemplative inquiry. Um, and it's my honor to introduce our guests of tonight, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake and Geshe Tenzin Nanda. Um, so starting with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who is a biologist and author of 90 technical papers and eight books, and also the co-author of six books. Um, Dr. Sheldrake studied nat natural sciences at, the Cam at Cambridge University and also philosophy at Har Harvard University. And as a fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, he was director of studies in cell biology and was also a research fellow of the Royal Society. He worked in India as a principal plant physi physiologist and also lived for two years in the Bene Benedictine ashram of Father Bede Griffiths in Tamil Nadu. From 2005 to 2010, he was director of the Ferret Boric Project funded from Trinity College in Cambridge. And he's currently a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences in California and of Schumacher's College in Dartington, England. And then Gashitens in Nanda first worked as an environmental researcher. He took ordination as a Buddhist monk from His Holiness Dalai Lama in 1993 before studying Buddhist philosophy and psychology at Sarah J. Monastic University in South India in 1997. He was the first Westerner to complete the 20-year Geshe program at Sarah J and the Vajrayana study program at Pune Tantric College. Because of his deep interest in science and as a member of Sarah J's education department, <clears throat> he organized and took part in numerous dialogues and conferences on contemporary science and contemplative wisdom. Currently, he is the resident teacher at Jamming Buddhist Center London and teaches worldwide. And finally, we're also honored to have Scott Snibby with us again tonight, who is a visual artist, entrepreneur, and executive director of the podcast, A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment. And Scott has kindly agreed to moderate the dialogue of tonight uh, again. So over to you, Scott, and many thanks to the speakers for tonight. Sure, well, thanks again for inviting me to moderate this. Uh, these are my two favorite topics of um, Buddhism and science. So it's incredible to have two great experts talking today. We're going to start out by asking each of you, Dr. Shedrake and Geshe Namdak, to give us, um, and this sounds a little amusing, I think, the question, to give us a short <laughs> introduction to your thinking on the nature of reality, uh, both from the scientific perspective and, of course, from the Buddhist perspective, um, and then go into an open dialogue about the topic, which will which can go into much more depth. So um, Dr. Sheldrake, since um, you're a guest who's never been with us before, we'd love to start uh, with you. All right, the nature of reality in five minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not used to this challenge, um, except when I lived in India, when I went on uh, train journeys in India, I often went on long train journeys and um, 
on the journeys, as I sat there in, in this compartment, someone would open a conversation and they'd say, what is your name? What is your native place? You know, uh, are you married? How many brothers and sisters? How much do you earn? They always ask that. And then they, so when they got through all those basic things, they say, what is your view of the nature of reality? And, and I had long journeys on Indian trains discussing the nature of reality. Um, this is, I think, the first time since Indian railways that I've been asked this question. Um, well, the, from a, 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 I don't claim to represent either orthodox science or orthodox religion. I was in uh, my own personal spiritual history with you know, Christian background, long atheist phase, indoctrinated into atheist materialism with my scientific education, um, discovery of the importance of consciousness through psychedelics originally, then meditation in the Hindu tradition and yoga, and then I worked in India and I was very interested in Hindu philosophy. Um, I was drawn back to a Christian path and I'm now a practicing Christian, an Anglican, um, so my own views of reality are shaped both by science and by Indian philosophy and by the Christian tradition. And so I can't claim to be speaking for a position that's a standard position that, um, that would be the standard scientific or standard Christian or standard Indian position. Um, starting with the scientific view. Um, what the modern science has done is shown that the visible kind of reality we experience through our senses uh, is in fact pervaded by many invisible connections. In fact, Isaac Newton in the 17th century, uh, when modern science really began uh, through the scientific revolution of the 17th century, came up with a vision of universal interconnectedness in his theory of gravitation, that every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle of matter. The whole of nature is interrelated by invisible interconnections. And we now call those the gravitational field, which links together everything in the universe. In the 19th century, Michael Faraday um, first discovered or named the electrical and magnetic fields and we now think of the whole universe as filled with the electromagnetic field through which light travels and not just visible light but invisible light um, in the form of x-rays, cosmic rays and so forth, um, um, ultraviolet, um, so lots of invisible forms of light. Um, and then through quantum theory we have the idea that there are matter fields underlying the very nature of matter and the matter we experience as hard and impenetrable is actually made up of vibratory patterns of activity within fields. Um, so uh, modern science, even conventional modern science, doesn't give us a view of reality being what it seems to be to the senses. Um, there's a great deal of interconnectedness the, uh, in many ways, one could say that modern science is in the business, business of explaining the visible in terms of the invisible. Um, and the other great vision of modern science is that the universe is evolutionary, not just life on Earth, not just human culture, but the entire universe, starting with the Big Bang, um, has been expanding, cooling down and evolving so that more and more form, structure, order, pattern come into being in a creative universe. So the, then um, if one then says, well, in this scientific worldview, what are the most fundamental realities? In the 19th century, people would have answered matter as the most fundamental reality. And that was the basis of the philosophy of materialism which says matter is the only reality and mind is derived from matter in the brain. Um, but in modern science, the answer to that question is fields and energy. Fields are what shape and structure everything. The, the sun is round because of the gravitational field. The, the uh, fields are what shape the natural order and energy is what gives it actuality, movement, change. Energy is what underlies the development of nature, the, it underlies matter itself. As David Bohm said, in the light of modern physics, 
matter is regarded as frozen light, that it's light energy bound in fields uh, vibrating um, uh, to give us matter as we know it. Now the big thing that's left out of this scientific picture is of course consciousness and the um, for, for materialists that is the hard problem it's called the hard problem because if you say that reality consists of unconscious matter and that's all there is then how do you explain the fact that humans are conscious well you can't and that's why it's called the hard problem so um, within science recently there's been a move uh, within philosophy of mind and indeed in neuroscience towards a more panpsychist view of nature saying that maybe there's some kind of consciousness even in electrons and atoms and that uh, consciousness in human brains emerges from less complex organized systems uh, but consciousness pervades all the uh, all matter all the universe now that is an increasingly popular view, and uh, but it still sees consciousness as sort of emerging from uh, complexities of matter. And it doesn't explain how the universe came into being in the first place, uh, nor does it explain the creativity within the universe, nor does it explain the source of forms and matter uh, and energy. Now, I myself as a Christian, um, see the ultimate reality as the Holy Trinity. The ultimate reality, or God in the Christian version, is not an undifferentiated blob, certainly not an old man sitting on a cloud, uh, but rather um, an organic uh, combination of a ground of consciousness. God the Father is rather right like the Hindu view of Sat Chit Ananda, being consciousness bliss. God the Father is like Sat in the Hindu model, the, the ground of conscious being. And when God first announces himself to Moses in the Old Testament, and Moses says, what is your name? He says, I am who I am, or I am that I am. A statement that God's uh, nature is of conscious being in the present, I am. Um, then the second aspect of God is the Logos, in the Christian Trinity, which Hindus would call names and forms, Nama Rupa. Um, it's all the forms of things in nature, that which can be known. God the Father is the knower. The Logos, or the Son aspect of the Divine, is the known. And to have, uh, you have consciousness which has this division within it of the knower and the known. And both of these are aspects of the Divine. Uh, both of them uh, are aspects of God. It's not as if God the Father, the Knower, is God and everything else isn't God. No, God the Known, the, the names and forms in nature, are a reflection of this inherent principle of names and forms, or Logos, within the Divine. But that by itself would be static. Um, and the Holy Spirit, uh, which is the dynamical principle in the Holy Trinity, um, breath, wind, or energy, is the moving principle which gives actuality and activity to things. So everything in nature, uh, both according to Christian theology and according to modern science, is made up of matter, uh, is made up of energy and form, or energy and fields. Uh, our bodies are shaped by the fields that, that, that shape living organisms. They're powered by the energy that flows through them and the breath with which we speak. Um, so uh, everything in nature has energy and form. An atom has energy which gives it its actuality and form, which gives it the, the quantum particles, the neutrons, the protons, the electronic orbitals around it. It's a structure of activity. Um, the, f the form is the structure, the activity is the energy. So um, I myself see all these aspects of nature as reflections of the Holy Trinity, the ultimate principle which underlies all nature and the evolution of the cosmos. So there you have it. That's uh, perhaps somewhat longer than five minutes, but uh, it's as short a summary as I can give. Yeah, thank you. And Geshe-la, if you'd like to start with the Buddhist view on the nature of reality. Yeah, so a similar problem will appear that 
uh, what we study in a traditional way in order to get a little bit ID of reality, we study for two decades, six days a week. And quite intense if I compare to my university students, students studies in the Netherlands, studying hydrology, then studying hydrology was kind of a holiday compared to what we've done in the monastery. So is to summarize it all in, in, in five minutes. Also, it's not an easy task. And also I uh, was in South India and uh, studying this kind of aspects of reality, so to say, and different schools of Buddhist thought and different interpretations that are possible. So you can imagine it's, it's a quite an, an in-depth kind of um, research. Yeah, it's not only what has been said in the different schools of Buddhist thought, but also we use logic and, and reasoning and the form of the language of epistemology. So it was a quietly different approach to reality compared to the, the science we used to uh, study at, at university and especially when I came from a back, background of hydrology, because then the language to describe a particular phenomena is mathematics and statistics, right? And we also had one very interesting um, subject, and it was the philosophy of mathematics. What can you and cannot prove? And in which, to which extent is what you prove the reality or an approximation of the reality? So that was very interesting. At that time already, I had quite some interest in these aspects of reality. So then, yeah, as you can see, I changed my life a little bit. <laughs> so that means that there's also not many people in the Netherlands who shave their head and walk around in ropes and spend like half the lifetime in South India. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of my background. And then coming back to yeah, the few minutes I've left to describe reality, and then it's also not an easy task. But yeah, let's give it a try. So generally speaking, we have two types of, 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 of truth, or we say we have two truths. That means there's a conventional truth and an ultimate truth. And it's not that they're two completely different entities or different natures, they also interact with each other. So what is this ultimate truth? This ultimate truth means that nothing exists from its own side. It is, has what we call an absence or a lack of inherent existence. So inherent existence means thinking that things exist without dependence. Right? So if you go back to, 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 to quantum mechanics or, or the interpretations of relativity, then we come to the conclusion that the correlation between the individual parts is more important than the individual parts. Yeah? It's a kind of a process. Also, one of my favorite uh, philosophers and mathematicians uh, of the past is, is Albert Whitehead, who had a very interesting kind of relationship between uh, these aspects of, of reality. Yeah? about the relativity between the different parts being more important. So that means that proves that nothing can exist from its own side. Nothing is independent. Nothing is, is, is and that also David Bohm issued, uh, comes to the conclusion of wholeness, that this fragmentation is a problem. Yeah? If we see things as an individual level and, and, and try to understand the, the complete process, that becomes very difficult. So that means if we see things as individual existence or without dependence, uh, that is not reality. And that's then we say the ultimate nature of everything is being empty of this or lacking this or have the absence of these concrete aspects of reality that we think it appears like that. And whatever appears, as we know, is not reality. Yeah. So that's kind of the ultimate nature of reality. And that is then proven by a conventional aspect of reality to different levels. Yeah, we have cause and effect relationships, which actually prove that there is nothing that can exist from its own side, yeah? uh, as we refute in the ultimate nature of reality. And not only everything is, is in, in causal and effect relationships, it's kind of a process, so to say, but also there's an interdependence uh, among parts and a collection of parts. Yeah? So that means there, there is no from its own side existing kind of a table or a computer or whatsoever. It's made up out of parts and those parts only function because there's a correlation between the parts. So that's kind of the second level of interdependence. And then the third level of interdependence is, is kind of a quite more difficult one to be understood because it talks about things are just merely imputed by a mind. Yeah, what we call a table, what we call Tenzin Namdak is just you know, Tenzin Namdak is just merely an imputation based on body and mind, yeah, within the continuity of this particular person. 
So that's a kind of a three levels, so to say, of interdependence. Yeah, so that gives an idea what is reality. Then with regard to consciousness, how does it relate to consciousness? Also there we can see that, as it's uh, just been indicated that we, you know, we've just been talked about the visible and the invisible, so to say, right? As Robert, Dr. Sheldrak indi indicated those, those two distinctions. So also in that regard, we have also kind of manifest phenomena. Yeah, phenomena we can see like objects that appears to our eye consciousness, for example, yeah, this manifest. But there are also hidden phenomena in the sense they are hidden from sensory perception, meaning we cannot perceive them with our five sensory perceptions. The only way to get an idea of that reality is by the talk process, means kind of uh, mental consciousness as we define it, that is a conceptual consciousness in the form of thinking and reasoning and using the language of ep epistemology, for example. And that has also two levels of, of kind of what we call the hidden phenomena. For example, if you go to our computer screen, then that has manifest aspects, right? The color, the shape is kind of manifest. We perceive with our eye consciousness. But the computer also has hidden aspects. For example, it's impermanent nature, that it's momentary changing, right? So the computer has that uh, quality as well. And that we cannot perceive without sensory perception. We can only reason it by the power of reasoning. Yeah? That it is momentary changing because it comes into being at one particular time and it disintegrates and breaks down over time. And to break down doesn't happen overnight. It happens from the time it comes into being, there's disintegration. And this disintegration moves all the way up to, to infinite periods of time. So if we talk about disintegration with regards with the Big Bang, it's, so we should have also just uh, indicated as certain scientists think that's the start of the universe, but it's more or less a big bounce, right? That means that there's a stream of, of disintegration of previous forms of matter before the Big Bang came into being. Yeah? So that's kind of things of, of reality that are not visible. Yeah? Things of reality that can only be found by the power of, of reason and, and, and epistemology at the present time, yeah, we, with, with empirical kind of uh, research, at the moment we are limited and we know that, and that also will develop. Yeah? So, and that is especially in regards to what we call the very hidden phenomena that we cannot reason even. For example, we here together meeting on this, on this Zoom event and this very interesting dialogue, when in each of us created at one particular time, created a kind of idea, oh, let's go to this conference or let's go to this dialogue, right? So when and where was the first initial kind of uh, thoughts that came to mind and how was that thought formed? That thought also doesn't came spontaneous randomly by itself. That is formed by previous moments of consciousness, having some interest in, in philosophy, having some interest in, in science. And also those moments of consciousness are preceded by previous moments of consciousness of other thought processes. So to say, each of us, it's not that black and white. For you, it's like this. For another person, it's like that. Uh, so that's a kind of a very hidden phenomena, but it is reality, but it's hidden for us, our sensual perception, as well as for our kind of way of logic, whatever we can use, or even in empirical forms of, of research. It will be very difficult to pinpoint the initial point of, of our thought process regarding our interest in this field. Yeah, so that's, yeah, a little bit in short. It's also probably a little bit more than five minutes, but that's the best I can do, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That was wonderfully clear. And um, actually, I think that I too am interested in the philosophy of Whitehead and the process view. And I actually think that almost everything you said is borne out by modern science. There's, I don't see any conflict between it and... Um, the, the scientific, the more sophisticated science we have today than 19th century materialism. I mean, the idea of interrelatedness of everything is part of a scientific worldview. The idea of a series or stream of causes that nothing just starts from nothing, um, there's a continuity. I mean, the, the, all these things are very much part of the scientific worldview and, and the interdependence and interconnectedness. 
Of course, the scientific assumption that the universe comes into being with no cause in the first place is a philosophical assumption. It's not actually proved by science. And, um, and so it's not, although it's part of the scientific worldview, it's, it, I would say, a naive assumption. And when scientists think about that, um, it, well, they don't think about it, really. As my, as my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the laws of nature and all the matter and energy in the universe from nothing in a single instant. Um, and uh, so that is, I personally, I think the Big Bang speculation or assumption is questionable and arguable, but I don't bother arguing about it very much with my scientific colleagues because it's entirely in the realm of speculation. There were no scientists around at the time of the Big Bang observing it and if they had been around they would have evaporated very rapidly since it was millions of degrees centigrade. Um, and um, so all we can do is speculate that the, the, the scientists speculate that the Big Bang happened. The universe is expanding now as, as far as we know it's always been expanding so if you just turn the clock back wind it all back then it gets smaller and smaller till you reach an initial singularity where all the laws of nature as we know them break down and basically that's the big bang theory it's an assumption as you say if you apply a principle of standard scientific assumptions of continuity then uh, you come to the conclusion there was a previous universe and this is a big a big bounce um, but again that's speculative as well i mean it's more logical than the scientific normal stand, standard scientific view but it takes us into realms of untestable speculation so I'm not sure it, I don't think it helps us very much um, uh, I think the biggest point of div divergence between modern science and the Buddhist um, views as far as I know about them and I know a little bit about them because my wife is a Zogchen practitioner and our house is full of tankos and 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 statues of uh, uh, Buddhas and green Tara and that sort of thing. So I I, I live surrounded by Buddhist um, decorative arts, um, but the the obviously uh, the when it comes to consciousness, uh, consciousness studies in modern science is a relatively modern area of science. Consciousness was more or less ignored until about 20 or 30 years ago within science. They proceeded as if it didn't exist and that scientists were somehow able to do all this science being conscious beings, but somehow that was left out of the whole picture. Whereas obviously the Buddhist uh, approach has been to concentrate on the nature of the mind and the nature of consciousness from studying it from within with a far greater intensity and over far longer periods than anyone in science. So I would say that the, the, by far the greatest strength of the Buddhist approach is this understanding of consciousness from within. Um, and I think that's why many scientists, you know, who've been, well, not many, but some have been meeting regularly with the Dalai Lama and there have been a whole series of discussions on science and consciousness. Um, but the, I think, the, the, from, as I see it, from the, big, the biggest problem from the Buddhist point of view is its greatest strength is this understanding of consciousness from within. Um, but uh, not necessarily a problem, but then uh, the, the, that's been the focus of the, most of the attention. Um, but then if you want to understand the nature of a plant and how a leaf of a plant develops, I started as a botanist and I'm currently writing a paper on the development of plant leaves and the veins in plant leaves and how different plant leaves have different shapes. Then the study of human consciousness doesn't shed much light, as far as I can tell, on the study of plant veins in plant leaves or the structure of crystals or many of the phenomena that natural science studies. And I'd be very interested to know how you see a, a bridge between these areas, since you, like me, share a, a scientific background. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, as, as you indicate, of kind of uh, the main emphasis of Buddhism is consciousness, because the Buddha's 
is Buddha's main motivation was to eliminate suffering, right? So then, then because of that, the main aspect of consciousness has been explained in great detail, as you indicated also. But in, in one aspect, also the matter or, or plants or, or whatever you call it outside and how that is formed and how it initially is formed and what is the process behind it, it's very similar, you know? In con consciousness, we have different activities that produce a particular feeling, right? And those particular activities comes from a previous inclination or, or a previous kind of habituation pattern or a process. And this habituation pattern or a process is not just kind of in certain forms of philosophy. It talks about seeds or potentials, right? And other forms of philosophy, for example, Lama Tsongkhapa's interpretation of one aspect of, of the great philosopher Arya Nagarjuna is talks about the term disintegratedness. That is a term we define as kind of everything that is impermanent, everything that's momentary changing is in decay every split second, right? It decays and grows and decays and grows. So this disintegrated aspect of reality of impermanent phenomena as such is not that when one moment disintegrates and becomes disintegratedness, that moment doesn't vanish as such. Yeah, so we classify that not as matter, that we classify in a group where we associate, as we call it, non-associated composition factors, which is a kind of level of reality that is not consciousness and is not matter, right? So it's not a visible aspect, what we can examine as such with, 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 you know, with empirical kind of research. But it carries information. It's kind of a process of carrying information of the previous moments and seeds, which produces the plant and the plant produces the different leaves and the different veins in the plant. That comes from, the seed came from a previous plant, right? And it's not just the disintegration of, of that previous plant that dies and the seed goes somewhere else, but that information of the previous plant, that disintegratedness, so to say, leaves a potential in the seed. Right? So this potential that is left in the seed, you can call it energy or you can call it the kind of field of energy, uh, that is not well defined in Buddhism. Yeah? We only merely talk about it's a non-associated composition factor in the sense it is not matter, it is not um, consciousness. So we can see it as a kind of energy, right? which is not perceivable with, with, with sensory perception. And it carries actually information from previous moments until the next. Yeah, so as soon as the disintegration starts of moment one and goes to moment two, at moment level of moment two, the disintegratedness of moment one is still present. Yeah, it doesn't disappear as such, though it's not matter anymore. It's not form. So that might be, I don't know, but it might be in, in a way of thinking about how information is carried from a previous moment of time into the present, because we're talking about space-time. Mm. Yes, we cannot we cannot pinpoint down uh, whatever you know object you look at. You have to see it in the context of space time, and if you in, in a process, yeah, you, as soon as you start to isolate a particular object or part of an object, you're missing out on this process of space time, and then to understand that process becomes more and more challenging because. If you're taking something out of the process and you don't see the process anymore, then it becomes very difficult to 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 describe this particular phenomena. Yeah, so that might be yeah, it's just a thought about it. it. Might be a kind of interpretation. Well, I think that makes total sense to me, and and the you know it's a kind of generic, not detailed explanation, which is fair enough. I mean, it's you know. The Buddha wasn't studying botany and, and classifying plants like Linnaeus and, and most Buddhist monks since then have not been doing that either. But as a general overview of what's happening, it makes complete sense. It makes more sense to me than it might to most scientists because, as you probably know, one of my ideas in science is, is of the idea of morphic resonance, which is the idea of a memory in nature. Um, this is not a conventional scientific view, it's treated by some people as a heresy. Um, I see it as a hypothesis. Um, but the, the hypothesis, uh, which I first proposed 40 years ago, and in fact developed when I was living in South India, and I wrote my first book on this, A New Science of Life, 
when I was living in Father Bede's ashram in Tamil Nadu. Um, the, the idea basically is that the so-called laws of nature are not laws outside space and time, but they're habits. And that nature forms habits, and there's a kind of memory within nature. Each species has a kind of collective memory. Every individual draws on that collective memory and contributes to it. So as a plant develops, for example, a foxglove, it's drawing on the memory of foxglove forms from previous foxgloves, a collective memory. And these shape the way its leaves and, and flowers and fruits develop and roots. And that there's and we too, as humans, have a collective memory, which is a bit like what Jung called the collective unconscious. So there's a, a kind of a memory principle in nature which leads to the formation of habits, and most things in nature are mostly following habits. And we ourselves are creatures of habit, and most of our mental life is habitual and unconscious. Not all of our mental life, obviously, because we're conscious of some things, but um, Anyway, this general view of habits in nature uh, and of memory that's transferred across time from one organism to another, in fact, from collectively from many organisms, um, is a familiar idea in uh, Eastern thought. I mean, in, in Hindu philosophy, it's been a, a, an accepted idea for a very long time, and, and Buddhist philosophy shares a lot of this with Hindu philosophy. Um, when I first thought of the idea of morphic resonance, the process by which the past influences the present on the basis of similarity, I was working in Cambridge um, in the biochemistry department at Cambridge University. And when I started talking about these ideas of morphic resonance, it didn't go over very well with my colleagues in the biochemistry department. Some of my colleagues in philosophy and history were very interested and discussed the idea. Um, but when I was, took up my job in an agricultural institute in India and I was working with Indian scientists um, and I had discussions with my Hindu colleagues um, and told them about this idea, none of them had any problems with it at all. They said, oh, that is nothing new in that idea. Ancient rishis have said this thousands of years ago, uh, you know. And so. Um, and so I, I found that they, you, you know, instantly identified this as a, a standard feature of Indian philosophy. Um, whereas in the West, it's treated as utterly shocking, even today, uh, and uh, utterly heretical. Um, but the, the problem I had with my Hindu colleagues, I said, well, OK, you're a, you've got a PhD in plant genetics, I said. Um, this leads to a completely different view of inheritance. If plants are inheriting things through um, influences across time from past plants, then inheritance can't simply be explained in terms of genes and DNA. Um, and at first they tried to pretend it could, and then I proved to them it couldn't. Um, at first they thought because they believed the Hindu philosophy and they also believed what they'd learned when they did their PhD in plant genetics, they must be compatible because the same person believed both. And I tried to point out they weren't really compatible, that if you have a theory of reincarnation, as Hindus put it, or rebirth, the transfer of traits from one life to another isn't encoded in genes, or it would be very, very hard to explain it in terms of genes. And so then I said to them, well, this would prove that science is radically inadequate. Modern science has got a very inadequate view of inheritance and of causation. I said, why don't you do something about it if you believe the ancient rishis had a better view all that time ago? Uh, and of course they didn't do anything about it because they wanted to keep their jobs and get promoted and get papers published in mainstream scientific journals and things. So uh, they just lived with two completely incompatible world views, like a kind of emulsion. Uh, uh, rather than a synthesis. So the problem I had in Cambridge was to get people to take this idea seriously. Um, and the problem I had in India was in a sense the same problem. I couldn't get Indian, my Indian colleagues to take seriously their own philosophy, or at least apply it to the science they were doing. They wanted to go on with conventional Western science. I hope that the idea of morphic resonance and memory in nature can provide a kind of bridge 
between these Eastern and Western philosophical views. Um, but what I, one thing I'm interested in, you see, is that my own view is that this collective memory means that we're all influenced by many people in the past, whereas the Hindu view of reincarnation, I know the Buddhist view is different, and that's what I'd really like to know more about. They, the, at least the naive Hindu view, the simple everyday view that ordinary people have is that you're in one life, you're one person, you die and then the whole personality is transported over into another body and you grow up and you were that person in a previous life. And it's like one to one, like strings of beads that, uh, you know, the, the one bead lead one life and it goes over to another. Whereas my own view is much more collective, that there's a kind of collective memory and we tune in perhaps to some aspects of it rather than others. But um, it's not that I, Rupert Sheldrake, was a particular person who died in, say, 1930, and that was a particular person who died in 1870, etc., etc. Um, so that's, I personally don't find that view terribly convincing. Now, I know the Buddhist view is different, and I'd love to know what you think about influences being carried over from one life to another in this context. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's two aspects here also you have to um, maybe think about. We have individual streams of consciousness, and we have a collective form of what we call karma or activity with other beings who have also consciousness, right? So we classify, like take the earth as an example, human beings and animals possess a particular form of stream of consciousness. And that stream of consciousness is individual as such. It doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end because every moment of consciousness can only be produced by consciousness itself. Yeah, a similar course should create the next moment. So then we come to a kind of infinite kind of recession or infinite kind of uh, moments where there's actually no beginning of the individual streams of consciousness. And as you know, also in Hindu philosophy, it talks about universal consciousness, for example, or you become one with, with God's consciousness, right? So we have similar aspects in Buddhism, but then it talks about the quality of something, that you get similar qualities as that universal aspect in your individual stream. So that's kind of a differentiation between becoming one with universal consciousness, we say we become a Buddha eventually. That means that we, we get the same qualities. It's not that our stream of consciousness merges with the stream of another consciousness. That's not the case. But we get the similar qualifications or the similar kind of aspect of consciousness. So that's one, one aspect of, of that streams of consciousness are individual. But that doesn't mean there's a correlation between two or or billions of, 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 of beings having similar types of having individual streams of consciousness, but there's a correlation in, 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 in for example, the pandemic. You know, that's a kind of example from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, most beings on this planet had the karma or, or so to say the potentials or we, we talk about basically what we talk about is probabilities. Yeah, we have probabilities in our continuity of consciousness created in the past. And it depends on external conditions for one or two or whatever probability to come in, to become manifest. And so that means that, for example, with the pandemic, take it as an example, most of us have the karma to be within this kind of lockdown or, or temporarily kind of aspect of the pandemic, right? But there are people, there's, that's, that's the common, that's our common kind of karma or common cause and effect relationship yeah, nothing is random in Buddhism. We have created a cause for this. Otherwise, it doesn't come into being. So that means we have all the probabilities for this to, to be in the same situation. But we have individual streams of consciousness because some people don't get sick at all. Some people get not even infected. And some people get infected but get not sick. And there are people who are infected and get sick. And among those, there are those who die and not die. So the collective aspect of, of, of all this is that we all in the pandemic, but are individual forms of experience. Yeah, so that actually proves that we have individual streams of consciousness as such. And yeah, that is there since the beginning of lifetime and goes all the way up. As Buddhists, we think we can all the way up go to nirvana or enlightenment if we train the mind, right? We have all these probabilities in our mind. So that means if we get rid of destructive emotions in the kind of 
process of purification, process of, of meditation on different aspects of the nature of reality, yeah, we can eliminate those kind of probabilities of, of, of the negative thoughts or the probabilities of destructive emotions as such. And then the only probabilities are left is kind of virtuous thoughts or virtuous state of mind, which actually produces kind of happiness, right? So that is kind of individual aspect of consciousness as well. So this, yeah, we have basically we have two, two, two. The correlation is not that individual remains individual without a connection with, with other consciousnesses and with the planet and with the sun. There is constant interaction. Yeah, nothing is, is individual as such. That's kind of a process between consciousness, matter, and what we call non-associated composition factors. Yeah, so that's kind of, or you call it energy. So if you call it morphic resonance, or you call it the implicate order, yeah, as David Bohm suggests, there is something there that we cannot see that is the process or an intrinsic nature that is un, un, has to unfold and in order to come, become manifest, as David Bohm indicates. So that reality is probably there. We see that in your theory, we see that in David Bohm's theory, and we see that across the Buddhist forms of logical philosophy. Mm. Yeah? But what is actually morphic residence? What is actually this kind of uh, the quantum potential? They're now examining more in UCL and here in London, as you know. So they will come up with a research very soon, and I'm very interested in, in their findings because that might explain a lot more about what is behind all this uh, reality, what appears to us. Yes, well, thank you. That's a very clear explanation. You have a wonderful gift, uh, Geshe Nemdak, for clear exposition. I really appreciate it. Um, that's, um, yes, well, the individual differences and the collective, yes, well, you see, I think that the morphic resonance, um, how it relates to David Bohm's ideas is that uses quite different terminology, but he and I were quite friendly and we had some dialogues and discussions about the relationship between his idea of the implicate order. Um, he thought the implicate order was a hidden order which underlies the explicate order, the phenomenal world, the world we experience, and um, shapes it and orders it. But the implicate order is in many dimensions. It's not in sort of normal three-dimensional space and time. and. Um, when I first met David Bohm, he thought of this as a kind of one-way process. The implicate order folds out into the explicate order. And my criticism of that was it was like Platonism um, in Western philosophy, that there's an eternal realm of forms or ideas that gives rise to the world we live in. But there's no memory in that. And Platonism doesn't have a memory in nature. It has the idea of that everything is governed by an eternal invisible reality. And because modern science grew up in the 17th century under the influence of Platonic thought, to some degree under the implicit influence of Platonic thought, as refracted through Christian theology, the idea that most scientists in the 17th century had was that, yes, nature is governed by an invisible ordering principle, and those are the laws of nature, which are ideas in the mind of God, and God was thought of as a kind of mathematician and it, an eternal mathematician with and therefore these eternal laws were eternal uh, because they were in god's mind and they were provided the hidden order underlying everything in nature now most modern scientists still believe that but many of them don't believe in god um, so what they've got is basically the ghost of the mind of god um, which is still full of invisible uh, ordering principles, the laws of nature, uh, which account for nature as we experience it in the view of conventional science. Uh, but without the theological background or any understanding, in fact, uh, they believe these laws are sort of free floating. And if you ask them, well, where are they? How do they work? They can't answer any of those questions because they haven't thought about it. But it started as a theological conception that was que fairly clearly worked out. And it's been degraded into a kind of undiscussed assumption about eternal laws. Now you see, to start with, David Bohm's implicate order was rather like that. And, but the, the challenge for any theory like that is evolution, that if, if you had any eternal laws, everything would just repeat. And the whole 
evolution review of nature is that it's creative, that there's a appearance of new things in the evol course of evolution. And also there's a kind of memory because what's happened before tends to be repeated and there seem to be habits. So David Bohm then, he modified his theory to say that the explicate order, what happens in the world that we experienced, phenomenal world, feeds back into the implicate order, what he used the word introjection, is fed back or injected back into the implicate order. So the implicate order is building up a kind of memory as time goes on. And so um, would act as a bearer of memory and, the, and habits would develop within it. Now, my idea of morphic resonance says the same thing, but uses completely different language. My idea is that similar patterns of vibratory activity will influence subsequent similar patterns across space and time from the past to the present. Now, if you say why, I just can't say why. I just say, well, that's a postulate, a hypothesis that nature works like this. As David Bohm's postulate or hypothesis was that there's an implicate order with a kind of memory uh, within it. Um, and so in that sense, David Bohm's idea and my idea uh, are very similar and quite compatible. And his idea forms a kind of bridge with the world of quantum physics. And my th ideas form a bridge with the realm of biology and psychology. Um, so in that sense, they're similar. But the big unsolved problem for all these philosophies, possibly for Buddhist philosophy as well, I don't know about that, but the big problem is creativity. And you see, science, conventional science that says all the laws of nature are fixed at the moment of the Big Bang, doesn't have new laws coming into being. They're all supposed to be there at the beginning. They can't explain why, and they can't explain why those laws are like that rather than some other laws. Um, and I, I can't explain, and David Bohm can't explain the Big Bang either. Um, but the evolutionary view of nature that came through, first through progressivist thought in the 18th century, there was the idea that humans evolve through science. The, the Enlightenment intellectuals thought that there was an evolution of humanity, but nature didn't evolve. Animals and plants didn't evolve. Only humans evolved. They became, became better through science, and they thought of Isaac Newton as a kind of god of this humanistic evolutionary worldview. Then Darwin showed, and others, showed that all of biology evolves, not just humans, but human evolution is part of a much wider biological evolutionary process. But physicists said, oh, no, no, the universe doesn't evolve. The universe is actually running down towards a thermodynamic heat death. That was the 19th century view. So biological evolution was a kind of anomaly in a universe that was gradually running out of steam and would eventually freeze up in the heat death. But then in 1966, when Big Bang cosmology became orthodox, we got a view of the entire universe as evolving. And that means that at one time there were no zinc atoms or iron atoms or methane molecules or crystals of salt, um, and certainly no forms of life at the time of the Big Bang. All these things have evolved in time, that the evolution involves a vast creative process. New things happen that weren't there before. The at some time the first eye appeared in an animal, the first feather on a bird, um, the first human appeared, um, the first thoughts, uh, human thoughts, the first language appeared in humans. It wasn't human language before that. So in the course of time there's an unfolding of new things. Now for any philosophy that I know of, creativity is a problem because most philosophers explain things in terms of what went before. And you can't explain a creative act in terms of what went before unless you say it's not really creative. It had happened before, but it's been forgotten or it was in another universe. And traditional Hindu and Buddhist philosophy, uh, as I understand them, are cyclical, that they see repeating cycles um, uh, rather than a creative evolutionary process. And, you know, traditional Western philosophy, Platonic philosophy, didn't see creative evolutionary process either. 
Um, and so I think that this evolutionary vision that we have in science provi provides a challenge, challenge for all traditional philosophies. I'm, I don't know if you agree or not. Um, partly, <laughs> not completely, but uh, so, I mean, if we just look at, at life, if we just look at life on, on our planet, for example, humans and, and animals and, and insects, right? So we say all those different, we classify as sentient beings, meaning beings that have a stream of consciousness. And as I indicated, we have individual streams of consciousness and collective aspects, yeah, that we experience similar things. So the stream of consciousness is there since the beginning of lifetime, and that means that since the beginning of lifetime, we have done all kinds of activities which leaves this kind of probabilities, so to say, or what we call potentials or karmic imprints, as we define it in, 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 in Buddhism. So these karmic imprints or, or probabilities within our continuities, that has many possibilities, and even the possibility of creating something completely new that we haven't experienced before, but similar. Yeah, so that means it's not exactly the same, but a similar process can happen. Yeah, and that's the whole law of karma talks about it. That we can be born as a human on a particular planet, but how we look like, the shape of our body, the length, that depends also on external factors. So it means we have these probabilities in our continuity of consciousness to be born as a human being at a planet at a particular time. But it also depends on the factors at that particular time on that planet, meaning what are the conditions in the atmosphere? What are the conditions for, for sustaining life? And that comes an interaction between the continuity of consciousness as well as external factors, and that produces a kind of creativity in one sense of a new being or a human being that looks different than the one you've been before. So it's a kind of a very complex process of Individual streams of consciousness, yeah, so consciousness is not matter, yeah, and consciousness imprints in this stream of consciousness, right, which is this disintegratedness, according to one particular very interesting interpretation, which means that nothing is lost, there is no information lost, so that also indicates the, the possibility of, of memory, and not only in the continuity of consciousness, but also in the field of matter, not a memory of a consciousness, but a memory of previous disintegrated aspects that are present at the moment in the form of probabilities. And that also, when that those moments of probabilities meet external conditions, then also there can be a new plant coming up because it depends on the soil, depends on what kind of uh, chemicals there are in the soil to develop. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, like what David Bohm says, the implicit and explicit order is not that two different, complete different kind of realities is a constant flux and what do you say it re-injects in in the implicate order uh, it's 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 memory so to say or it's disintegratedness right so is a flux of coming more manifest and uh, because the flux of becoming more manifest or becoming more dormant because there's different types levels of reality and the information that is stored or the memory if you want to call it that is stored is this disintegratedness of previous moments right and that is not classified as matter or as consciousness hmm. but it interacts with those two and it interacts with external conditions as well so that gives an opportunity for us to develop or have this kind of creativity of new plants we haven't seen before or or human beings developing in a similar in a different way though similar <laughs> but different outlook than than, than previous uh, forms of, of human beings for example Yes, well, that's, um, that's a, I think, a fairly a, a plausible way of dealing with it because, I mean, the, the idea of probabilities, of course, is standard in modern science. I mean, it's, it's interesting that this is part of the Buddhist approach because probability is, is the very basis of quantum theory and indeed practically everything else in science. Um, in the 19th century, people thought that everything was predictable and completely fixed. And now uh, we recognize that through quantum theory, through chaos and complexity theory, that actually practically everything is probabilistic. Certainly in biology, it's all probabilistic. Um, when you look at a leaf and you look at the vein pattern on the leaf, there's a rough, roughly similar veins, but even on two sides of the same leaf, the veins uh, have a different pattern. And on every leaf of the same tree with the same genetics, they, they're different. 
So um, I think that general approach is, is actually supported very strongly by conventional science and t today. Also, the idea that it interacts with different situations which change in different planets and different climates and different eras, um, that also, make again, makes great sense. Um, so what I would uh, conclude from what you've just said is that within the Buddhist philosophy there's the potential for creativity for new kinds of plants and people and ideas and so on. Um, but in the past, I imagine Buddhist philosophers didn't place much emphasis on this. The potential was there, but uh, Buddhism didn't come up with Darwin's theory of evolution or the Big Bang theory of cosmology, and, and neither did Christian theology, or neither did uh, in, 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 within science itself. It was an evolutionary process that this evolutionary view emerged. So, um, there's if I understand you correctly, you're saying within the Buddhist philosophy there's the potential for creativity, and indeed this can be realized. It, creativity doesn't pose a challenge to the basic foundations of the philosophy. But for, in the past, Buddhist philosophers didn't emphasize this because they had no need to, uh, because it wasn't a big issue. Whereas in an evolutionary cosmology, it's a very big issue. Would, it, would that be a fair summary? Uh, yeah, that's correct, because uh, what I say, like also with language, we have to be careful, because when I talk about probabilities, we we have different terminology within the Buddhist context of philosophy, right? We talk about karmic imprints, so to say, but it's a similar kind of approach. Yeah, It's, it's a similar kind of approach in the sense that there are all these possible different types of karmic imprints, and it depends on external conditions for it to come to ripening or not. So we're talking about probabilities, right? Yes. And then in a similar way, it, with Darwin's theory of evolution, it, it can be completely explained to a certain extent. The species develop over time, though although they have individual streams of consciousness, but they have these probabilities or of being born in this particular place on the planet and develop in this particular way because of, of, of the temperature on the planet or because of the different external factors of, of the food that is needed to come about. So there is a development, an external one, but that depends on the internal uh, beings who have carried this continuity of consciousness. Otherwise, the development will not happen. So there's constantly a correlation in creativity in this case so we can fully support from, from this stream of consciousness with the probabilities and then depending on the causes and conditions externally, like climate, etc., for being to develop in a particular way, right? So that's like Darwin's theory, we, we can completely accept in the sense of, of different types of consciousness. They take what we call rebirth in the form of these kind of creatures because at that particular time on this planet, you know, in this kind of space-time kind of event, then the causes and conditions are such that this being develops in a particular way. Yes, mm -hmm. so that, that falls quite well in, in, in the, the, the philosophy behind it. Yeah. Well, I think it would be very interesting to, I don't know if there's anywhere in the world where people who are uh, Buddhists are trying to do science in a different way, because it would lead to very different predictions. For example, I think, on the basis of morphic resonance, that our memories are not stored as physical traces in our brains. You know, I think memories are resonance, and the reason we have our own memories is because we're more similar to ourselves in the past than we are to anyone else. And on the basis of similarity, our memories are caused by a kind of resonance across time. Um, the standard materialist view of memory is that everything we remember is because of some modified nerve ending or RNA molecule or some physical memory trace inside the brain. And of course, people who believe that materialist view believe that when you die, the brain decomposes, all your memories are wiped out and that's it. There's no possibility either of reincarnation, rebirth, transfer into a collective unconscious or anything else, because it's all just matter inside the brain. Now, presumably the Buddhist view would be more that memories are, work not just as matter inside the brain, they interact with the brain, but they're not in it. Um, and so, if there were a, a Buddhist university with Buddhist neuroscientists, then 
uh, it, I'd, I'd love to see a Buddhist university with Buddhist neuroscientists doing research on memory going beyond the materialist theory. Um, unfortunately, science is a kind of tyranny at the moment. In all countries, whatever people's philosophy, they will do the same kind of science. And, you know, but it would be wonderful to think that in, in Tibet or in Thailand or in Sri Lanka or in some Buddhist country that there, were, there would be a, a Buddhist university doing science in a completely different way. Do you think that might would ever happen, or do you see um, Buddhist ideas somehow influencing scientists to do science differently? I, I mean, it would be very exciting if they did, in my view, but um, have yeah. you ever seen any evidence of this happening? Uh, it, it's not that it will happen, it already happened, right? Because we have a lot of research being done between the correlation of consciousness and brain activity. Yeah, so Richard Davidson, for example, is one of the probably the world leading experts in the field of, of, of the, the you know what effect does our consciousness in particular with regards to mental state of meditators, what does that how does it influence the brain? Yeah. And also in the fields of, of, of for example, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, there's a lot of research being done between the correlation of consciousness, what we call consciousness and the physical brain. Yeah, there's a correlation, but is that correlation causal? And so how does consciousness produce a particular brain activity or does brain activity produce a particular state of consciousness? And both ways of traffic is possible. If you have, for example, a severe OCD issue, then the brain tells you what to do. You're not in control. But if you train your mind in, in what Jeffrey Swartz, for example, a very interesting personality in, in the treatment of, of obsessive compulsive disorder. He, he uses kind of Buddhist techniques of, of what he calls the, the power of mental force or, or mental activity or, or kind of mindfulness training to teach the, the patients to think about something else at the time the brains tell you to do something else. Over time, if you train well, then consciousness actually produces the brain, right? We do brain's activity. So that causality is, is two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. so, so that's definitely there. And then with regards to other forms of, of science that proves that consciousness is not a brain, if we follow, for example, the needed experience, when there's a clinical uh, you know, cardiac arrest without 10 to 20 seconds, uh, the oxygen flow to the brain stops and the brain is dead, right? According to our, our neuroscientific interpretation. But there is perception at that time. Mm. And to certain, depends which kind of research you depend upon. Uh, if you think about Bruce Grayson, one of the, uh, in America, uh, the psychiatrist who did a lot of research, we got need that in big experience. And he came to figures of 90% what people perceive is accurate. Well, the brain is dead. So that is, that is basically evidence. That is scientific evidence. And of course, we have different research about children remembering previous lifetimes very by Professor Stevenson from the University of Virginia and his student Jim Tucker, which proves, that's very interesting to see because um, Stevenson didn't say, I'm proving reincarnation. He says, but it's very interesting, he says there is something that carries the information from a previous personality to the present. It's very interesting. But we call in Buddhism the continuity of consciousness. Right. And then a more newer field to develop in the Buddhist culture or within the Buddhist society in relation with neuroscience is what we call the tuktam or the clear light mind of death meditation, which we only have up till now documented or we have data of about 13 cases only because it's very rare event. That means a person is clinically dead, has practiced in this life, this mostly happens with accomplished masters, and they stay in the clear light mind of death for a week two weeks, and just last April, we had one in, in, in Goethe Tantra College, who stayed for 37 days in this clear light, which means that there's no decomposition, no decay of the body, though there's no heartbeat and no lung function. So according to the present findings, uh, there is nothing measurable with EEG. They have measured or brain activity as such. So from the Buddhist point of view, we say in the Vajrayana, kind of explanation of these points, that consciousness is still present, but in a very subtle level. That means coarser forms of consciousness, especially sensory perception, they correlate with the brain, they need the brain to function. 
But there are states of consciousness, the more subtle you get, the less, the less dependence on the brain is needed. Like, for example, in the near-death experience. As we see, there's perception, and the perception is validated, and certain research that prove 90% is valid. Mm -hmm. And then in this near-death experience, in this uh, event of the Tukdam, or the clear light mind meditations, the doctors, they come, they, com they consider this person is clinically dead, there's no heartbeat, no lung function, but there's no decay of the body. So then the question is, how do we explain this? And then from the Buddhist point of view, we say there's a very subtle consciousness present in the body, which stops the decay. And when that subtle consciousness doesn't need the brain to function, and there's some accomplished masters, they meditate on the ultimate nature of reality at the time. But when the consciousness then leaves the body, there's different signs to be seen, then the body starts decaying. So it's a, a very interesting aspect already, quite some research already started in, in, uh, in these lines, but yeah, much more is needed, of course. Yeah. Mm. Would be very interesting, yeah. Yes. Well, very good. That was a no, very good summary of this field of research. I think you're right, actually, that the, these areas of research are they changing our view of consciousness. And what was regarded as merely anecdotal in the past is now being properly and rigorously investigated. But by too few people. I mean, I, I, I know Bruce Grayson and I knew Professor Stevenson. And in Holland, I know Pim van Lommel, who's done very good studies on near-death experiences and in much more rigorous conditions because he's a cardiologist um, than in accidents and heart attacks. Under controlled hospital conditions, you can observe the details much more. No, so I think you're right, actually, that these things are opening up. But I look forward to the day when instead of just three or four centers in Western countries, uh, in Buddhist countries like Japan, Thailand, etc., and possibly China too, uh, people start, if it were done on a larger scale, there's more motive for Buddhists to do this than people who come. Uh, in the West, many scientists are materialists, and many of them atheists, and uh, would be opposed to this research. But in Buddhist countries, it would be perhaps easier to open the doors as time goes on uh, for this research. Um, and it's obviously not only interesting scientifically, but it's of enormous interest to millions of people because it's relevant to our human lives, much more relevant than most of the research that goes on in scientific laboratories today. So I'm, I've just noticed the time. We've gone beyond our yeah. allocated time. Uh, yeah, one this is... A... I just want to just... Uh, because there are this kind of research already going on in the monasteries itself, right? In, in, in my own monastery, Sergei, we have a science department which, you know, has a lot of kind of relationships with university in the West, and they do a lot of kind of research regarding, you know, brain activity as such. So it is developing, right? It just is, it needs some more time and, and, and funding and, and effort. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, but yeah, it's still time because we'll be given nine questions and we didn't even go to one of them, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I'm delighted to hear it's happening in monasteries as well. I didn't know that. Very, very pleased to hear that. Yeah, so that was an extraordinary conversation, and I didn't expect us to go beyond the first question either. <laughs> um, so we'd like to open it up, though, now to the audience. If you have any questions, um, you can raise your hand using that reaction function on Zoom, if you have them. And actually, if there aren't any, I could I can easily start with one um, because I'm very curious. You've you've talked about that there can be a, a continuity of form or habits explained through either karma or morphic resonance, but there are these moments um, in the origins of life uh, that are as profound as the Big Bang, right? The moment when the rocky Earth suddenly has a self-replicating organism, and also how is the potential within the first self-replicating organism with a simple you know binary genetic code capable of evolving towards a human being with who can make iphones and spacecraft and buddhist monasteries and, and so on um you touched on that a little bit the creative pr principle but especially those you know it's that those particular binary moments from rocky planet to <laughs> living life and then from simple life to the extraordinary complexity of our, our, our human minds and behavior. Is it possible to touch on those uh, questions very briefly? Uh, you can, I mean, 
from the point of view of, of, of continuity, we have to be clear that uh, the materialistic world or matter as such and, and the continuity of consciousness within the continuity of sentient beings. There's two different things, right? Though they interact with each other, but it's two different things. So that means that a being having consciousness comes from a previous moment of consciousness and the previous moments come from previous moments. And what, for, what kind of being that is going to be developed depends on this kind of karma or these probabilities within the continuum of that particular being, right? So it is different from the involvement of, of creation of matter as such, yeah? Although there is also the disintegrated aspects of previous moments which carries the information throughout space-time. Yeah, when one, when one particular planet like Earth, you know, starts to explode or whatsoever, yeah, if we heat up the Earth a little bit more and, and it starts to burn everywhere, then the human beings and those who have consciousness, they slowly will die out, right? And they'll be born in other places in the universe, yeah, because there's much, much other places with life as well. So that means that the particular Earth will disintegrate and, and in the future, the same kind of continuity of matter because of the probabilities when it meets external conditions, it can create a kind of new planet or, or maybe climate change happens again. And, and so, yeah, you have to be distinction between the continuity of the consciousness within sentient beings and the mere matter in the materialistic world, so to say, although there's a correlation between the two. Yeah. And Dr. Shedrake, what would be your perspective on this question? Well, that was a really interesting answer. Um, my, well, I would take the view that the, um, you know, the, the normal discussion of the origin of life is that the materialist framework is taken for granted, that here's this entire unconscious universe, stars, galaxies, planets, rock, uh, totally unconscious, totally dead, and then miraculously or by chance, here on Earth, the first life appears and has the potential to become us. Um, well, a bit like Geshe Namdak, I, I don't really accept that view that the whole universe is totally unconscious to start with. And um, like Geshe Namdak, uh, Namdak, I think that if there are other planets where life has already evolved, then by morphic resonance there could be influences to this planet and evolution on this planet could be shaped by influences from others. But that pushes the problem back uh, to other planets and other forms of life. Um, and you could argue um, that given the Big Bang theory of the universe, at one stage there were no planets. So the Big Bang was billions of degrees centigrade. There was no, not even atoms. It was too hot for atoms or even plasma. Um, so there must have been the first life somewhere, even if it wasn't here. Um, but I don't take the view that the whole universe is unconscious, you see. I think that if we take the view that the entire conscious, the entire conscious, the entire universe might have a kind of mind or consciousness, and a galaxy might have a mind or consciousness, a solar system might have a mind or consciousness, a planet uh, might have a mind or consciousness, and therefore when the first life appears on that planet, it's not as if consciousness has come from nowhere, from total unconsciousness, um, but it's, it, it's coming into being within a larger, more coherent conscious system, and which may play a role, a creative role, in the emergence of life within it. So, in the case of the Earth, if we take the view that Gaia, the Earth, is a living organism, um, that there was a kind of not just rock, but also oceans and swirling currents and clouds and atmosphere and hydrothermal vents and clay that sort of dried up and then uh, during the seasons and got wet again, all sorts of changing conditions that might have been allowed for the emergence of, of life within Gaia that the mind of Gaia may have played a role in that emergence of life. We don't necessarily have to explain it in terms of a, a, a bottom-up emergence from mere inorganic or simple organic chemicals to more complex ones. To, the, the usual view is this bottom-up view. But actually, even within modern physics, um, there's 
a top-down view. I mean, the gravitational field is a top-down field that includes everything in the universe. It doesn't emerge gradually from bottom-up from particles of matter. It's there from the beginning. And according to superstring theory, um, the initial there was an initial unified field of all nature with 10 dimensions or 11 in brain theory or M theory. Um, and that these um, underwent a, a, a kind of splitting, these fields of nature split up, gravity separated from electromagnetism, uh, but originally it was one combined field. And that these top-down fields have shaped the universe from the large to the small, so it's not all from the small to the large. And if these overarching organizing fields have a conscious element to them, then we have a kind of interaction between the small and the large, which puts that problem in, uh, in a different light. It doesn't explain it. It doesn't give us any sense of detail of, as to how the first life happened. And, um, but it suggests that we don't necessarily have to look for the origin of life in purely blind inorganic matter and random collisions of atoms. Mm. We have a question from Alexander. Would you like to ask your question? Unmute. Yes. Hello there, both respected speakers. Thank you so much. Love, love, love from both, uh, you know, your hearts. You can really feel the consciousness coming through. So that's first and foremost. But my question is about changelessness and beginninglessness. So how to follow up on Scott's question. My question is, if the universe is expanding, then what is it expanding against? Very interesting. I mean, basically... When we think about beginningless time, right, our consciousness is there since the beginningless time. Why? Because within the stream of consciousness, we cannot really find a beginning as such. Because every moment of consciousness is being preceded by a previous moment. Right? Then when you talk about the universe, then the universe doesn't have an end. Yeah? We live in a particular galaxy. In a similar way, a particular Big Bang happens in one part of this endless universe. That doesn't mean there are big bands in other parts of the universe, most properly, right? So the universe doesn't have an end. There's no border as such. So it's infinite space, right? So that doesn't, uh, that does in a certain way implies that within that infinite space and then time and space taking into example, then one big band in one part of this infinite space influence another big band in another part of, of this infinite space and then we have the correlation between planets and correlation between different kinds of universe systems, yeah? because it's all part of the whole. So uh, going back to the universe as consciousness or, or these planets have consciousness, but if there's an interaction of, of this process of, of uh, different moments in time, in space-time, then with these probabilities of cause and effect relationship, it depends upon external factors in order to develop in a particular planet as such. And so that is uh, what we mostly probably interpreted from the Buddhist point of view. But then on top of that, how it, an earth develops also depends on the karma or the collective karma of the sentient beings that are actually living in that particular planet. And so if we take our planet earth as an example, to have the temperature right, as we have at the moment, if you see how many factors are needed for the temperature, the distance of the sun and the distance of other planets, gravity, and, 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 and you know, the, the, the many aspects of the weather patterns, to get it all right is very, very difficult. If you see all the variables that are needed to get it right for human life to evolve, right, then we, we need a particular kind of cause and effect relationships of the beings that live on this particular planet. So that's the correlation between individual streams of consciousness and the potentials in those streams of consciousness or the probabilities of living in a place like this and the external uh, involvement of, of, of planets uh, like, like our own planet Earth. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I, that's an astonishing vision. I didn't have much to add, um, except to say that the idea of you know, this the idea of space and time, the philosophical discussion of them and, and the universe goes back a long way. And in, in the West, one of the um, philosophers who thought about this was St. Augustine. And he pointed out that space and time come into being with the universe. Um, it's not that the universe comes into being within space and time. Space and time come into being with the universe. 
So if the universe expands, there's no point of view that any of us could possibly have that's outside it. We're always inside it. Um, and mathematicians, if you say, well, how can it be expanding? What's it expanding into? Then they say, well, it's 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 bounded. It's it's you know it's infinite but bounded. And and then you start asking, what does that mean? And you, they then blind you with mathematics and talk about extra dimensions and so on. Well, I can't follow all those uh, extra dimensions. Um, I'm easily blinded by mathematics and I sort of tune out at that point. Um, so I suspect it would be possible to give an answer to this question uh, which would blind uh, us all with mathematics but I'm not capable of doing it. Um, so I can't say I lose any sleep about the question of what it's expanding into because the universe we actually live in um, has a light horizon uh, there's, there's, it, it, the universe is larger than we can ever know because light travels at a finite speed and there's a, there's a limit to how far we can possibly see or observe. Um, and uh, I think once we sort of get beyond all these limits, we're in realms of pure speculation where we're not actually finding out much about the universe, we're just finding out about our own minds and the way we think. Barbara has a question. Barbara, you can unmute. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Josh, Barbara, hi. Hi. Um, oh. oh, I think sorry. Barbara. Oh, oh but no. sorry, 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 sorry. Other Barbara. <laughs> sorry, you can come next to Barbara. Um, yeah, well, first of all, like Alexander, I um, really appreciate the discussions. It's really excellent. I've preferred, I've had the opportunity to see both of you in the past in the flesh and hopefully in the not too distant future that might happen again. Yeah, but um, Rupert, if I would like to ask you, um, I'm not sure that I've heard it, about you and the Christian um, view of reincarnation, um, because I don't, I think we spoke more about the Buddhist perspective. And I guess you like, I was wondering if there's time, would you be able to speak just a little about the clear light of death meditation? I'm, I have a mm -hmm. fascination on meditating on death and... <laughs> And, you know, bringing death more to life as I think about it. That was um, two questions, really. That's okay. Oh. All right. Well, I'll try and say something about... If we're talking... I mean, obviously, the central feature of Christianity is Christ. I mean, that's why it's named Christianity. Um, and one of the central points is that the, Jesus Christ in his human existence combined both being a human and a divine consciousness and a lot of Christian theology is concerned with trying to work out what that can possibly mean um, and there are two main schools of thought um, within Christian theology right from the beginning there's the in the Gospels there are four Gospels of course and in the Matthew in the Gospels of Matthew Mark and Luke the view of Christ is, is sometimes discussed as ascending Christology. Jesus Christ is born a human being, and through his personal development, his baptism, his revelation uh, at the moment of his baptism through a kind of mystical unity with God and the ultimate reality, and through his life and through his death and passing beyond death, um, he becomes one with God. So a human consciousness becomes one with divine consciousness. St. John's Gospel has a different view, descending Christology. Divine consciousness descends into a human being and takes an incarnation in human form. And um, so uh, the, Jesus is right from before he was, you know, before he becomes a teacher and all that kind of thing. He's, uh, God has descended into human form um, and God becomes man. And the other view is man becomes God. Um, and then, of course, there are people who say, well, why has it got to be one or the other? Why can't it be both? Um, so um, I don't think there's a single answer to this, but I think that the, the, the whole point is that Jesus is, is, takes on this divine consciousness as a human being. And the Christian doctrine of the... the death and resurrection of Jesus is that he passes through death 
his his body disappears. Um, some people say, well, isn't this a bit like the rainbow body? You know, it, he disappears, and and then he appears to his disciples, and he appears to people in their dreams and in visions. As he appeared to Saint Paul in a vision. Um, that this uh, is it, he continues to live in in a way that's accessible to people through their consciousness, through their dreams, through visionary experiences, and through a kind of personal relationship. Um, um, and he so he continues to act as a kind of interface between the divine and the human realms. Um, so that that seems to me how well, that's what makes sense to me anyway uh, as a way of understanding it. Um, and of course, the doctrine of the incarnation is surrounded by various mythic elements. The idea that the Virgin Mary was a intact virgin, uh, etc., seems to me a mythic element rather than necessarily literal truth. And I think its mythic power is really un un uh, underlies a potential which in the Orthodox and Roman Catholic worlds has been developed through the idea of Mary as mother of God. It's a way of assimilating the feminine principle and where and the great mother goddess of the ancient world didn't need men in order to conceive. She was so powerful, uh, the mother goddess, she could give birth without males being around. So in a sense it's a kind of proto-feminist principle rather than a blushing, shy, um, uh, you know, the virgin who is afraid of sex and stuff. Um, um, it's, it's so. I mean, there's all sorts of ways one can interpret this, and of course, Buddhist stories about elephants and virgin births and so I have mythical elements as well. Um, so I think all religions collect a lot of mythic elements. But my view of the incarnation would be roughly along those lines I've tried to summarize. All right, and clear light minds. <laughs> Yeah, he needs a little bit more time. But uh, So what happens at the time of death is very similar what happens when we fall asleep, right? The sensory perceptions, they cease to exist. And the mind becomes what we call mental, consci mental consciousness remains. So it's very similar to falling asleep. As you know, if you fall asleep slowly, you feel your body sometimes sinking and, and the sound stops, right? So at that time, only mental consciousness is left. Sensory perception stops. So mental consciousness also has coarser forms and, and subtler forms. And by the power of, of, of meditation, you can make subtler types of consciousness or states of consciousness, you can make manifest in the waking state, you know, normally when people practice. The more you habituate to that particular subtle state of consciousness, then you will be able to recognize it at the time of death when it comes by the power of dying, that consciousness comes, becomes manifest. So an ordinary person will not recognize it. Although in the near-death experience events, as also one of my favorite authors and, and uh, scientists behind this, also Pim van Lommen, it's very interesting to see the research behind it and what people actually see, right? Not only visions, but also actually perception that is valid. Yeah? So that it's happening with a consciousness, what we call mental consciousness. It's not the clear light of mind yet at that moment, but is a very subtle one. Yeah? So a clear line mind of that meditation means that when all the sensory perception stops and mental consciousness becomes to a most subtle level just before it leaves this body and goes to another birth, right? So at that moment we talk about, or just when you fall asleep, just before the dream starts, we talk about a subtle moment of consciousness. So accomplished practitioners, they can use it to the extent to achieve enlightenment. Uh, there or in the next port, point of the bardo, right? So then, to go back to Dr. Sheldrak's interpretation of human becomes God and God becomes human, in Buddhism we have something very similar. If you have achieved enlightenment, by being a human first, achieve enlightenment, so the human becomes a Buddha, then in order to benefit others, the Buddha shows an emanation and takes the aspect of, of, of being born somewhere. So then the God or the Buddha becomes human again in order to, to help society, right? So that's, and it all happens from the point of view of this subtle moment of consciousness just before it leaves the body. And that continuity always remains. And there's a continuity also very interesting or important to know. It's also 
always a non-duality of the most subtle mind with the most subtle energy, which proves that we can establish in a future life not only a mind, but also a body. And in this continuity of the mere subtle mind and energy, there are all these potentials or these kind of probabilities are also present, which causes us depending on the power of prayer or depending merely on these probabilities, where we are born, how we are born, and how we develop. Yeah. Yeah, is that okay for the time being? Barbara? Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you to both of you. Roy Gillette has a question, if you'd like to unmute. Yes, um, thank you very much. It's a wonderful day, wonderful evening. Um, in fact, Geshe, thank you so much for what you just said, because it virtually um, sort of takes most of my question. Um, mm. It's this idea of the continuation of consciousness that we were grappling with through the conversation earlier. And... I've always thought that the, at the time you die, the state of mind you're in is something that you grasp onto that carries you forward to another incarnation. If you take an idea of reincarnation, most religions see the moment of death as very important. The Catholic religion, you have to take um, a particular sort of forgiveness of sins at that moment of time, you know, absolution. And um, so it's the state of mind you die in that is the grasping that's left. I mean, Gesh has described the ideal way to die and the enlightened way to die. But for most of us, it's that grasping, that regret at the point of death. And then that's dragged forward to be wanting to be born at a certain point of space and time at a future incarnation to work out more of this negativity that's left in this grasping that died in the previous incarnation. And that's how, for me, the continuation of consciousness happens. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely true, and it's not only in the Buddhist tradition, as you know, many traditions, it talks about the, the moment of dying, or the consciousness at the moment of dying, the way you're thinking, or what kind of emotions are coming up, is very crucial for your future existence. And that talks about these probabilities, right? We have a lot of probabilities, that either because one born one part of the planet, or another planet, or there's so many probabilities there. So that means when your consciousness thinks about something positive or you want to benefit others, right, in this particular planet and you want to have a good education and, and help others the best way you can, at the moment you're dying and you have that state of mind, it will activate these probabilities. It's a law of cause and effect, nothing else. There's no creator as such who is in charge. It's just the continuations of probabilities that gets activated by a particular way of thinking. So that means that at the time of death, when you think in a positive particular way, may I be born there and there because I want to help sentient beings to develop in science and to make a correlation with, with, with philosophy and let people generate more constructive emotions and eliminate destructive ones. Yeah, if you have that kind of state of mind when you die, it activates these kind of probabilities which causes this kind of stream of consciousness to be born in a place and time that is according to your wishes, more or less, right? Or according to the previous inclinations or the previous imprints or the previous created probabilities. Yeah. Dr. Sheldrick, do you, do you have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's a pretty good explanation. Um, Josh Barber, I think you have a question. Hi, thanks. Um, Sorry, Barbara, for interrupting you earlier, and thank you both for a very fascinating discussion. Um, I just have a couple of questions. One was on the question of evolution, the evolution of life and the evolution of the whole universe. And to what extent each of you see that as progressing towards some kind of ultimate end? And in which case, what, what is that? And, and is that a point of, of difference between you or, or, or a point of similarity between you? Um, and the other question was to do with Rupert's um, view of Trinitarian view of ultimate reality as a Christian and, and wondering whether you see a, a relationship or correlation between that and the Buddhist idea of um, three kayas. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll, um, I don't know whether it's correlated with the three kayas because I don't know enough about Buddhism. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear what Geshe Namdak says about that. Um, in terms of evolution, 
what is it evolving towards? I think this is one of the ultimate mysteries. And, you know, there are people like the philosopher Tyre de Chardin who have the idea that the evolutionary process is moving towards some higher level of consciousness in which human consciousness plays a particularly important role, not just on this earth, but in terms of the whole universe. Now, exactly how that would work I don't know, and I don't think anyone knows. Um, and right now, our scientific worldview is so limited that what happens in human consciousness here on Earth is entirely a provincial affair confined, confined to the Earth, with no influence on anything else except in so far as we might send the old rocket to Mars or something and make a dint on the surface of Mars, but it, it's not going to affect stars in the rest of our own galaxy or galaxies anywhere else in the universe. Um, the materialist view, of course, is that consciousness is confined to our brains. And so, but, so we need to expand our view of consciousness and the interrelation of consciousness, not just within our own planet, but uh, what if there are other planets like the Earth in other star systems? Could it be that our human consciousness could in somehow, uh, in some way relate to theirs? How could it happen? Well, it's not going to happen through radio signals too slow. Um, it could only happen through some kind of interplanetary telepathy. Um, but you know, when you look at the number of people in the world researching in telepathy, I'm one of them, but there's about 12 people in the world doing research on telepathy. Most universities won't touch the subject with a barge pole. So it's not as if we're on the threshold of some great breakthrough in interplanetary telepathic communication. Um, we very, know very little about the potential for um, its connecting us up with other forms of consciousness. And we know very little about the way in which our connection with the divine consciousness or with ultimate consciousness um, would influence the rest of the universe. It's not easy to see from any traditional religious perspective, which misses out the rest of the universe as discovered by modern science, why you need billions of galaxies, each one with billions of stars. Uh, because most religions portray this as a drama going on between us and ultimate consciousness, or God. Um, uh, so what's the rest of the universe got to do with it? It's a big mystery, and I think that we no the traditional theological system has really had to deal with that question. I mean, the Hindu and Buddhist cosmologies, well, the Hindus spend more time on cosmology, and Buddhists slightly discouraged it. Um, do have these vast cycles of universes and a vast conception of the universe, much greater than anyone had in the West until very recently. Um, but um, it, exactly how our consciousness relates to all that is, in my view, something we just simply don't know. And um, So I could speculate, but I, I hardly know how to speculate about it. It's, it's such a vast question. All right. So, I mean, two points to your question, right? Or two questions, so to say. So one aspect of when things come to an end, right, that the whole universe or the stream of consciousness doesn't come to an end. But within the whole universe, there are individual planets or whatsoever that comes to an end. But the, the, the universe in the infinite aspect, there's no end to it. And that's also true for the stream of consciousness. Yeah? There's no end to consciousness at all. There's no beginning and there's no end in the individual streams of consciousness. Although there is an end to the, what we call contaminated streams of consciousness. Yeah, to come to the next part of your question, that means that if you eliminate all faults as we have, or all destructive emotions together with their potentials or together with their probabilities, if you eliminate those aspects of the consciousness, then a pure consciousness remains, right? And then of course, it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm ex explaining now, but that gives you an idea that the stream of consciousness doesn't stop, but the contaminated aspect, as we have at the moment, that can stop. Yeah, we can purify our minds, eliminate all destructive emotions like anger, attachment, not understanding reality, right? So then you develop your mind that you completely understand reality, yeah? or what we call omniscience, or the omniscient mind of the Buddha. And as I just indicated in the, in the, in the answer to Barbara's question, that 
the most subtle forms of consciousness have been explained in the Vajrayana and also in the Kala Chakra Tantra or the Wheel of Time, it talks about the relation of, of our being and, and the cosmos and the different aspects of, of reality in, in, in the different planets, etc. But to, to come back to that stream of consciousness that has this kind of uh, subtle stream of consciousness that goes from this life to the next and that goes together in a non-duality with the most subtle energy, right? So that means that can produce a consciousness in the future as well as a form aspect. That's why we have the human body and we have, you know, in, in the Hindu philosophy, we talk about name and form. In Buddhism also, we talk about name and form, right? Meaning consciousness as well as physical body. So at a time when you develop this consciousness to the full extent, meaning you have eliminated all its faults and you have accomplished all the qualities and you generate this kind of omniscience mind, then you become a Buddha with your consciousness or you achieve what we call the Dharmakaya, right? Or the, the truth body of the Buddha. And because you have the non-duality with the subtle energies, which creates the form bodies of the Buddha, right? So we have the Embohakaya and the uh, Nimanakaya, right? So that stream of consciousness in the most purified form with the stream of this most subtle energy creates this kind of, in the future, if the right cause and conditions are present, creates this kind of bodies or the three kayas of a Buddha, so to say. But it doesn't say that consciousness stops at that time. Consciousness remains, but is at that time a pure form of consciousness without any uh, faults or without any misunderstandings of reality. At that time, you, the things we talk about now and for many of these aspects, we completely, I mean, maybe not completely, but for a vast majority of, of what, what we discuss here, we don't really know what's going on, right? So if you have this omniscience kind of consciousness, been developed over, we talk about eons, which is a very long period of time of development, but eventually on the spiritual ladder or spiritual progress, it's possible. And then, yeah, then if we have a person like that here in the audience, then the, he or she will be able to give us all the answers we were uh, asking each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Does anyone, is anyone in the audience enlightened and want to answer that question? <laughs> um, we have time for one more question. Um, from Anais, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to both, uh, well, actually to all, to all of you. Uh, I'm finding it hard to, to make the question in my mind, so I'm just going to drop it to see uh, if it makes any sense. So, Geshe Tenzing, and I would like to, um, to ask you about your views in emptiness and interdependence. So I'm fascinated by the concept, by the Buddhist concept of emptiness and interdependence. And I'm also a little bit familiar with, uh, of course, really super honest, really superficial level uh, to um, modern physics, so to quantum physics. And I think that uh, but empty, both emptiness and interdependence can be explained um, in a really amazing way from the physics, from the modern physics point of view, when we correlate them. So I was wondering if you can, if you can share some of your views in, in this matter with us, please. Thank you very much. So, I mean, <laughs> thank you for the question, but there will be another dialogue, I'm afraid, because emptiness and, and, and depend origination, you cannot, I cannot explain within one or two minutes, right? So, uh, but to summarize, meaning it's two sides of a coin. Yeah, we, I started today with explaining conventional reality and ultimate reality. That means the conventional morality is the interdependence among the different aspects of reality, meaning parts and a collection of parts or cause and effect and, and being merely imputed by the mind. So those three levels of interdependence prove the ultimate nature of reality, which is emptiness. So emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness means an absence of something, something that is not there. And that mere vacuum or that mere absence, that we call emptiness. So what is that? Meaning empty of inherent existence, that nothing exists independent all by itself, that does not exist. So everything is empty of that aspect. You see that? So as this room is empty of an elephant, uh, that in a similar way, the zoom, the screen, our body, our mind is empty of inherent existence. There is no inherent existence in the sense of an independent entity of body and mind that doesn't exist. So we say it's empty of that, 
right? So that's kind of in short what we call emptiness. But if you're interested, very auspicious, because tomorrow we're going to start with Nagarjuna's philosophy here in Jamyang. And that will go on for quite a few Wednesday evenings. And that will go in depth uh, in these kind of points of ultimate nature of reality and dependent origination. According to the philosophy of Arya Nagarjuna, who is being considered as the most superior philosophers of ancient India uh, when it comes to this aspect of reality. Yeah. So it'll take some more time to sink in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else to add, Dr. Sheldrake, before we wrap up? No, I was, that was a wonderful explanation. Thank you. Well, it, it's been a privilege uh, having you two incredible beings speak with each other. Um, I really benefited a lot. And I'll hand it over now to Saida and Marco to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks once again to Dr. Sheldrake and to Geshe Namdak. And thank you, Scott, as usual, for your skillful moderation. Um, we are going to quickly share our screen to say thank you to the amazing team of Jamyang Buddhist Center um, and the amazing team of volunteers of Science and Wisdom Live, and also to our um, partner, Mind and Life Europe. And we're also very happy to make a couple of announcement regard, regarding upcoming events. Yeah, so the first is our upcoming online event, which is called Healing the Body, Healing the Mind. Um, so this is a weekend full of talks, workshops, and teachings on the mind-body connection in, collabor in collaboration with Jamyang London Buddhist Center and also with Land of Medicine Buddha in the US. Um, so this event is free of charge and it's in June. So if you would like to join us, it would be absolutely wonderful. We also have uh, a new podcast coming up, uh, which is a podcast interview with Jason Upton, who's a UPCP registered existential psychotherapist and also senior lecturer at Regents University. Uh, and he has practiced Tibetan movement practices for over 17 years, which he, will, he actually talks to us about in the podcast, uh, amongst others about the importance of uh, embodiment and how to become embodied again after COVID. And lastly, as you might know, we are also in the middle of our fundraising campaign, 21 for 2021. Um, so if you are enjoying our talks, dialogues, and podcast interviews, uh, and you are in a position to do so, please consider becoming a patron of Science Wisdom in Life or make a smaller donation. Uh, so if you go to our website, www.sciwislife.com, you'll see that there's a link there to our crowdfunding page at the bottom of our homepage. And finally, we, we are going to have more online talks, podcast interviews, um, online dialogues and science days. And <clears throat> if you would like to uh, get occasional updates on our future events, please follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter. And all our events will be available free of charge on our podcast and YouTube channel. So please sign up uh, on our website, sewislive.com.